Hello, it's B again. I'm about to talk to you about assignment two. Assignment two has five parts. But actually it's not that huge. It does take up a certain amount of detail and it can be a bit daunting when you first look at it. But it's quite an important aspect of, of the work because it deals with planning. Consequently, this particular assignment is very closely linked to uh, the business of your teaching practice. Part A is creative. It says part A, part one of part A says create a scheme of work for a course you're teaching or may intend to teach. That means to say this scheme of work can be an imaginary scheme of work. It doesn't have to be one you actually have taught or intend to teach. It could be something which you're inventing which is within your subject area which you can submit as an example of a scheme of work that could be possible. It is better if the scheme of work you're submitting is actually one you're going to use within your teaching practice. But it doesn't have to be. My advice is to get in plenty of practice creating schemes of work. It's something you're going to do an awful lot of during your career. This scheme of work should be a minimum of 30 hours contact time in length. That's to say the total number of hours shown in the scheme of work and the single scheme of work must be 30 hours at minimum. If it's too short, you'll have to make it longer. One of the biggest mistakes we had last year was that people submitted schemes of work which were for 20 hours when it really should be 30 hours. By the way, this is 30 hours in one single scheme of work, not two. Secondly, create at least three teaching or lesson plans based upon the scheme of work above to meet the aims and individual needs of all learners and requirements of curriculum or teaching. That is to say, out of the scheme of work you've just created, design three lesson plans. Preferably, I would imagine, lesson plans that form a sequence. So, you know, the first three sessions, or the middle three, or the final three, or something of that sort. Again, it will help enormously if these three lesson plans are the ones that are, we, we see when, you're, uh, when, we, when I come out to see you at teaching practice. But it doesn't have to be. What we need is an example of you being able to use uh, and create a lesson plan based upon a scheme of work. Can I point out also that the scheme of work and the lesson plans should use the standard Gateshead templates that I've already sent out to you. Um, this is important. The only exception to that would be in circumstances in which you are working for an employer uses a different style of template, in which case that would be acceptable instead. Please try not to invent your own, even though that might be quite a, you know, a useful thing for you to do outside of the course itself. And very often people do invent their own scheme of work and lesson plan templates that they use themselves. Part three of part A, explain how the planning you did via your scheme of work and lesson plans meets the individual needs of learners, and how the plans should be adapted where required to meet different learner, le learner needs. So look at how the planning that you did in the previous documents met the needs of learners. Say how your lesson, your, your, your scheme of work and lesson were suitable for the learners for which they were intended, how it it gave the students within this, they were taking on board this, this particular course, the opportunity to progress in their learning. Look at how you're taking on board, for instance, their ICTs, uh, literacy and numeracy needs, and also how your, the, the, the particular uh, scheme of work suited the kind of level of the student, their previous experience, and, and, and how the, much flexibility was built in with regard to their ability to contribute to how the, the, the course itself uh, 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 how the course content is developed. Look at also how your plans could be adapted, in other words, how they might be changed if necessary, where required to meet different learning individual needs as they crop up. Try not to be too rigid in your planning, but look at how you could adapt these. Finally, in the, in the first part, part A, analyze how feedback from your learners can affect your individual practice and identify opportunities in your planning where learners can provide you with feedback. This is about evaluation, in effect. On your teaching practice, look at an opportunity to ask your students or find some way of getting feedback from your students which can provide you with some way of developing how well your uh, planning and your individual practice, your methodology and so on, how well that's gone. And once you've got that, analyze how this feedback can affect 
what you've just planned. In other words, it's part of the teaching and learning cycle, but looking at how your students have, have reacted and been, and, and, and been supported by the course they've been through, or the event they've been through, the learning they've been through, and look at how that will uh, affect how you do uh, uh, revision of the scheme of work and lesson plan you've been using. Okay. Part B. Analyze how minimum core elements can be demonstrated in your planning for inclusive teaching and learning sessions. Say how you involve ICT, literacy and numeracy and embed it in the teaching and learning that you do and how this can be adapted for the kind of people you teach or the people you are involved with, the groups you're involved with, the individuals you're involved with across a wide range of, of, of skill levels how you would do that within the how you would embed these elements within your uh, within your work secondly provide an example of how you applied minimum and core elements in your planning for inclusive teaching and learning and explain what why you did this say how you applied minimum and core elements in your scheme of work or your lesson plans and why you did it the way you did it for instance an example might be for instance if I was teaching uh, geography I might say for instance that we did some quantitative work looking at how areas of land uh, can be measured in terms of using maps that would involve a certain degree of numeracy why did I do it this way because it's suitable to the uh, subject area it's not bolted on artificially and it will allow people to have a practice of skill which is both useful outside of geography and also useful inside the subject itself so think about it in those terms, not about applying minimum core elements as a sort of add-on, but how you would use them on a day-to-day -day basis in the work you do all the time. Part C. Analyze the role and use of initial and diagnostic assessment in agreeing individual learning goals. Have a look at how in your planning you look at the current situation with students' abilities, their weaknesses, their needs, and how you go about doing that assessment. Also, how, it, how you look at that assessment and how you would implement it and what information you get from that, how that informs how you do your planning. So one of the things we've got to look at is what initial diagnostic assessment methods you're going to use and how this, uh, it, this informs what you do in terms of how you plan sessions and plan your schemes of work. Part two, part C, identify the assessment methods generally used within the organisation or field of work and discuss their benefits and limitations. What kind of assessment methods do you use on a regular basis? Not just one or two. Look at three or four methods. Yeah. Look at how you, you use them. Are they appropriate? Are, they, are there limitations to how they work? Do they produce evidence which is uh, uh, relevant, which is consistent, which... It, 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 it is predictable and, and, and measurable. Think about those sorts of things and other aspects of the way in which your assessment methods both stress your students or don't stress your students, whether they challenge your students or not. Those are the things to look at. Part three. Explain how you use methods of initial and diagnostic assessment to negotiate and agree learning goals with, with learners. This is about how their ILPs, individual learning plans, are developed. How do you negotiate and agree learning uh, 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 objectives or goals or outcomes with your, stu with your students in such a way as it complies both with the needs of the course itself, if it's an accredited course, but, but lets them to come up with their own targets, both during the course and towards the, you know, the, over the long term of the course itself? What methods do you use in order to agree learning goals with them? And how, are that, how, is that, how is that recorded? Item four, record the results of initial and diagnostic assessment and individual learning goals according to your organization's requirements or guidance or common practice within your field of work. Again, this is mostly about how do you use individual learning plans or records of assessment or tracking sheets. Uh, there are various ways this could be done. It depends on the organization's concern. When we look at an initial diagnosis, we look at various methods of doing that. If there is one already in place in your field of work or your employer's field of work, fine. If there isn't, we will develop something of the sort. Part five, it says include a copy of two learners' learning goals and assessment records. Don't forget this. You need to submit 
as part of your practical aspect of your of your teaching, a copy of two learners get learning goals. In other words, what would be useful is either uh, a couple of copies, not the originals, but copies of ILPs, which would have learners' goals in it, or something like that, and records of their assessment. Now, these need to be real learners that you've taught. Okay, just two of them. Okay, so we need both evidence of their planning around the business of their goals and evidence of the assessment you did with them and how this was recorded. It could be simple sheets that give tracking over the way in which they achieve their, their learning outcomes. It could be something more elaborate. Again, we can dis discuss this in tutorials and discuss it in the class on assessment when we get around to it. Part D. Reflect on your own practice, analyzing the effectiveness of your planning and supporting the individual needs of learners, and taking into account feedback and views of learners and others. Once again, this is about evaluation. Reflect on your own practice. You need to reflect on your own practice in your learning diaries. Remember your reflective diaries. Make sure these are up to date because part D mainly is about that. Analyzing the effectiveness of your planning and supporting the individual needs of learners. In other words, reflect on how well you design schemes of work, how appropriate these schemes of work are, how you plan your sessions to be as involving and participative as possible, and how enjoyable, how challenging, how active they really are. And take into account the feedback you're getting from your students as to how well this is going. And others, for instance, managers, other teachers who have seen your work, such as observation and teaching and learning, advisors who you happen to you may know. You may even get Ofsted feedback if you happen to get visited. I don't know. It's, it's unlikely, but you never, it occasionally happens. Make sure you hold on to any feedback you get from other people within your profession who know you and have seen you teach, because this is vital stuff in terms of feedback on your practice, and especially the effectiveness of your planning. In addition, when you get your teaching practice reports, there is a section at the end of the teaching practice report which lets you reflect on not only your performance and your, the way in which you taught during that session, but also your planning. So please don't forget to fill that in. It's vitally important as part of your evidence. Don't forget. Okay? Okay. Lastly, you will know this, you must ensure your assessment criteria for, for the unit are met, so you have to mark assignment 2 using the sheet that's attached. You detach it from assignment 2, you fill it in, you tick off your, the, the criteria you've met, and show which page or section of your assignment this has been met, or note down where these, the criteria were, were created. Hand that in with your work when you hand in assignment 2. Uh, if you want to assign an assignment two in two parts, for instance, the scheme of work and lesson plans, duplicate the sheet and just hand it in, uh, 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 hand in the sheet uh, uh, partly filled in for the part you're, for you're, you're handing in to me. Okay? Don't forget to do it. Got that? You sure? Sure you got that? Say yes, B. Yes, B? Good. Okay.